Good afternoon. I'm Leela Abed, Deputy Director at the Mexico Institute here at the Wilson Center. It is my pleasure to welcome everybody that is joining us virtually for the panel component of today's event. The Mexico Institute is launching its femicide initiative titled Engendering Safety, Addressing Femicide in Mexico. Our objective is to address skyrocketing femicide rates in Mexico. On average, 11 women are murdered and more than 20 disappear every day in Mexico. According to Mexico's National Institute of Statistics and Geography, from 1990 to 2015, there was an annual average of 1,681 female homicide victims. From 2016 to 2020, the case number doubled to 3,568 femicides annually. Last year was one of the deadliest years for women, with a record 3,642 women murdered, of which over 1,000 were classified as femicide. Therefore, through collaboration with different stakeholders, the Mexico Institute's Femicide Initiative seeks to raise awareness, develop public policies that can reduce and ultimately eradicate femicide in Mexico, as well as inform Mexican legislators on the issue. We have put together an ambitious agenda that will analyze femicide from a variety of perspectives. We will host a series of events and consultations to help inform a report that addresses Mexico's legal and judicial framework to develop policy proposals and identify best practices to reduce rising femicide rates. This report will be delivered to members of the Mexican Congress in an, em in an effort to inform future initiatives and reforms on the subject matter. Today, we kick off this initiative with an incredible group of panelists. For those of you joining us virtually, we regret that, we were, that you were not able to watch the screening of the docuseries Caníbal Indignación Total. Fortunately, the executive producer of the documentary, Javier Tejado, is here with us today and will share a summary of the docuseries for our virtual audience. Also joining us this afternoon is Dr. David Shirk, professor and graduate director of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of San Diego, and a global fellow here at the Wilson Center. Dr. Shirk has done extensive research on the problem of femicide in Mexico, and you can find his latest publication focused on the role of special prosecutors in combating violence against women in Mexico on the Mexico Institute's website. We will also have recorded remarks from the President of the Supreme Court of Mexico, Justice Arturo Saldivar, who is also a producer of the docuseries, and the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission of Women, Alejandra Mora Mora, who regrettably could not join us in person today because of a last minute trip to Peru. And just as a quick reminder to our virtual audience, you can submit questions for our panelists through email at mexico at wilsoncenter.org or to our Twitter account at Mexico Institute. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of our discussion. I also want to thank everybody that's here in person and a special thanks to our sponsor, Constellation Brands, for supporting this event. And with that, we will begin today's panel with Javier Tejado, who will be giving us a summary of the docuseries. Welcome, Javier. Thank you, Leila. Thanks for having me here. Well, you just watched chapters four and five, uh, but le let me just give you for the original audience a uh, virtual tour of what's going on. Basically, uh, the story starts with the disappearing of a woman, a woman whose name is Reina, and uh, as the series evolves, you find out that uh, uh, her family finds her after a 24-hour investigation, and what their family find uh, basically, it's uh, they found the, the, the home of a serial ki killer, a femicide, a femicide that started killing women in 1992, exactly the date where uh, the, the Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter's movie, came into being. Basically, he tried to emulate what uh, Hannibal uh, was doing, and he started killing women. And, he, and basically, he didn't stop killing women for 31 years. It's an, it's an incredible case of how someone could go on killing women for 31 years without being captured. But when finally a family, a family really, it's the husband, the mother-in-law, and, uh, and, uh, and the sister, started looking for this uh, missing woman. Within 24 hours, they were, being, they were able to, 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 find, to find her. Unfortunately, they were a bit late and they found her, her body, her remains. However, um, 
it, it, it makes you wonder what was going on with, uh, with the local authorities that after 31 years they didn't look for those women. How many women did this guy kill? Uh, that's uh, still on the review. Uh, on the documentary, we found evidence of 54 killings uh, and uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of bones, uh, bless you, uh, out, of, um, out of one of three properties that were owned by, 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 by the, 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 fem the femicide. Uh, however, the exact amount of women will probably will never be known. Uh, the first, the first uh, moment he was captured, he confesses to police, killing an average of two women per week for 30 years. That's what he mentions. After he got his public defender, he never mentions this number again. Actually, he only confesses to the murder of Rain, the last victim, even though we ha he, he filmed uh, what he did to most of his victims. So we have seen and we have more than 50 videos of what he did to his victims. He only confesses to the last victim. It's a very uh, horrendous story. Basically, that one talks, you, talk, talks about impunity. How could someone be killing women uh, for such a long time? But the killer no, no, not only was a very uh, efficient killer, he was also uh, elected as the um, as a uh, as president of the of the township. Basically, you know, it, it's a township which holds uh, several thousand people, like twenty-five thousand people. And he was elected as president of the council, and he uses as he uses as president to disguise his criminal activity. But he was very well known. And not only did he did he kill women, but he he also uh, ate part of their bodies, and he gave the rest of their bodies uh, away. And he he made uh, cannibals, uh, thousands of people in 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 in, in the outskirts of Mexico City. So it's really really crazy that something like this could go on for such a long time in the outskirts of one of the major cities in the world, and without authorities ever doing anything, you know. And once, basically, we started to, to review the case, it was just at the start, it was just a case about this femicide, serial killer, killing so many women uh, for such a long time. And Dilcia, the, 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 guy, the, the woman with a, with a little hat, basically uh, being the, 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 the prosecutor trying to put him in jail. And as we started following, we, we saw a huge number of of missteps in the, in the in the investigation, and uh, basically the story came a twist. And, and and Bruno, when I spoke to him, he hated the same the authorities as the serial killer. So it was really really amazing uh, how how angry he is, and how all the victims are angry with the authorities. And uh, basically that is that is the the, the documentary. Um, it aired a couple of weeks ago, to our surprise. Uh, it, a it aired on two public channels, Channel 2 of Televisa, which is a private network, and Channel 22 of Conaculta, which has, it, just, it, it is um, a public TV, TV channel. Basically, they, they were both running at the same time. On both channels, uh, it, even though it aired at 11 p.m. at night, it got record-breaking break numbers. Uh, we had never seen on, on the public television at any time that type of audience basically on channel 24 uh, the average daily audience component according to Nielsen in the Bope, was 300,000 people on the public channel and on Televisa's channel 2 network we had around 5.5 million people every single day watching so the 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 the, the way the audience basically embraced the, the the documentary was amazing According also to Dinsel Libope, which does the TV ratings in Mexico and here in the U.S. as well, uh, the, the, the increase of viewership was in all sectors of the audience, but particularly two sectors. Uh, uh, people in the DE socioeconomic sectors, which is uh, the low-income people, which basically they stayed up at night to watch the series, and also most interesting, people in the AB plus sector. So that's basically the high-income people that they usually do not only watch TV, they watch basically just uh, uh, over uh, over the top of platforms. They they turn to be. So it was impress impressive numbers uh, at this time of day. 
we have never seen such a huge uh, audience. And in part to this uh, outcry of, of, of the Mexican people watching TV and all the networks and all the media talking about it, within uh, five days, five days after the, the last episode aired, basically there was a joint session of Congress and all the political parties and the president of both houses of Congress were, were there as long as uh, my, my, my co-producer, the Chief Justice, and basically they presented a number of laws to overhaul all of the regulations that basically have to do with uh, gender discrimination, how to investigate femicides in Mexico. So um, it's in the process of, of being uh, voted, but so far not only are we happy with the way audience has, has, um, has seen the, the, the docu-series, but also how Congress, it's, uh, Congress and the media how they are taking it. So basically, um, for me, that's what I have to say for now. Of course, I'll be open to your questions, but I'm very, very thankful, first of all, for the Supreme Court to have allowed me to produce this, this film and also for the Wilson Center to have me here as our panelist. So thank you very much. On the contrary, Javier, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. I, I mean, there was a lot of disturbing images on the two episodes that you screened uh, previously, um, and I, one of the things that I take away from it, Javier, was the fact that, you know, the families have to do the, the work f of the authorities in many of these cases. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, Dr. Shirk, you will get into some of that um, in, in a few minutes. Before we, we jump into our panel discussion, um, we will hear recorded remarks from the president of Mexico Supreme Court and your co-producer, Justice Arturo Saldivar. Maybe in a minute. I think we were supposed to. All right. Well, um, we can. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Hola a todas y a todos. Primeramente agradezco al Centro Wilson la oportunidad de que esta serie pueda ser presentada y sometida a su amable consideración. Una de las cuestiones que más nos preguntan o que puede generar inquietud o curiosidad es por qué un tribunal constitucional, por qué una Corte Suprema participe en la producción de una serie documental. Hay que decir que esta serie se inserta en una tradición de la Corte Mexicana de utilizar el arte para denunciar injusticias. El edificio de la Corte Mexicana está plagado de murales en los cuales se denuncian injusticias y anomalías de nuestra vida social y particularmente del sistema de justicia. Tenemos una serie de murales muy famosos y de una enorme calidad de la década de los 40 del siglo pasado de José Clemente Orozco, un gran muralista mexicano de los tres grandes muralistas mexicanos en los cuales se denuncia la corrupción, la injusticia social, la explotación, la frivolidad de los jueces y de las autoridades. Hace una década, poco más de una década, se recibió el mural de Rafael Cauduro que se llama Siete Pecados Capitales. Ahí se denuncian todas las injusticias de nuestro país. Los expedientes hacinados, oxidados, en archiveros, como si no hubiera seres humanos detrás. Las violaciones, los feminicidios, los secuestros, la tortura, la represión por parte del Estado, retratadas con una fuerza artística impresionante. Cuando recibimos algún visitante extranjero, se sorprende de que en un edificio del Tribunal Constitucional de México haya esas denuncias tan terribles. Hoy hacemos esta denuncia para generar reflexión a través de una serie documental, pero es dentro de esta tradición. 
Desde hace unos años hemos estado viendo cómo en distintas partes del mundo instituciones públicas participan en procesos de elaborar documentales o series documentales o series en general para tratar de producir un cambio cultural, una reflexión. Pues bien, en México tenemos un gran problema, un drama social colectivo que son los feminicidios. Alrededor de 11 mujeres al día son privadas de la vida por crímenes de odio. Mientras la sociedad y las autoridades tratamos de mirar a otro lado, mientras parece que la violencia ha tomado normalidad, en donde parece que los feminicidios son parte ya de un paisaje. No queremos que esto siga así. Por eso en esta serie, a partir de una línea conductora, de un caso terrible, de un feminicida serial, tratamos de ir generando una reflexión colectiva sobre el por qué son los feminicidios, de dónde deriva la impunidad y a partir de ahí unidos como sociedad y como autoridades, buscar soluciones y alternativas para revertir esta tendencia. Esta obligación y responsabilidad pedagógica de la Corte afortunadamente está teniendo un gran éxito. Estamos teniendo ratings muy altos en esta serie que se está transmitiendo en el momento en que grabo este video actualmente en, en nuestro país, en México, y espero que a partir de ahí se puedan tomar medidas concretas, que todas las autoridades en el ámbito de nuestras responsabilidades nos sumemos, que la sociedad nos exija a todas y a todos hacer mejor nuestro trabajo y que juntos y juntas los mexicanos y mexicanas avancemos hacia un futuro mejor. Gracias por su atención, un saludo respetuoso y afectuoso desde la Ciudad de México. We thank Justice Arturo Saldivar for sharing with us um, this video uh, here at the Wilson Center. With that, we're going to transition into the panel discussion. And I, I want to start with you, Dr. Shirk, because I, you know, I, I made reference to your latest publication, which I found to be extremely interesting, and, and your findings were, were extremely remarkable. Um, you found that states that have special prosecutors for the investigation of femicide are substantially more likely to classify female homicides as femicides, um, increasing investigation of femicide cases by 50% of the cases on average, I'm sorry. But another thing that I found to be really interesting, Dr. Shirk, was that something I honestly did not know um, in detail was that states have different ways of classifying femicide. And it, I mean, the, the system is not homogenous in, in, in terms of you know, what states consider femicides and how they classify them. So can you, ex can you um, tell us a little bit more about the, meth the methodology that you use, the findings that, that, that you, know, you found, and, and um, sort of a little bit how you came about um, this research and, and what it says about Mexico's justice and legal framework? Sure, happy to do that. Um, first of all, thank you to um, Andrew, uh, Lila, um, Sam, uh, everyone from the Mexico Institute for having me here. Uh, it's wonderful to be back. It's wonderful to be back in person. Um, uh, it's unfortunate that the topic is something uh, so, uh, so sad and so uh, difficult. Um, the study that we conducted uh, and the working paper that we released through the Wilson Center and through our Justice in Mexico program at the University of San Diego looks at femicide uh, through uh, a, a statistical lens, uh, but also uh, we did a lot of research on uh, the uh, legislation that has been really uh, ongoing in its evolution in Mexico since the 2007 uh, femicide law was passed, uh, since a new law was passed in 2015 in Mexico uh, at the federal level. Um, and over the last several years, as states have implemented um, laws to uh, penalize fe uh, femicide as a special category of crime. And I think the first thing that's important to point out is that um, Femicide as a concept developed uh, in an effort to uh, establish the key differences that exist between 
killings of women and killings of women with motive, uh, with a gender-based motive, right? And so the state laws and the federal laws classifying femicide as a crime are trying to identify the specific characteristics of a homicide that are um, gender motivated, that, that make essentially um, a, the killing of a woman a hate crime. Um, and hate crimes, and we have hate crimes in the United States, we do not have femicides in the United States. It's not a category of crime in the United States. Um, but a femicide in that sense is a kind of hate crime that um, has been identified in Mexico and other Latin American countries. Uh, and the burden on the prosecutor is to establish what makes this a hate crime? What are the specific acts um, or intentions that motivated a homicide that we can use to classify it as a femicide, which has uh, tougher penalties associated with it? So in these different states, um, you have guidelines from um, federal legislation, but you have states that have chosen to identify different uh, specific characteristics of a crime uh, as being a femicide. Um, and often that involves uh, specific motivations. Um, uh, let's see, there's a, a, whether the um, victim presents signs of sexual violence of any kind, for example, whether or not Oh, I'm sorry. Are we going to go yeah, through this can we, presentation? I think you need to tell them uh, when sure. you want to change the slide. Sure. Um, I, well, I'm, I'm, do you want me to do the presentation or do you want me to answer your questions? Because I'm happy to go either. I mean, I'd rather you answer my question. All right. Well, let's <laughs> just, do, if we, you want to do the presentation, we'd be happy to see it. Um, uh, well, so let's take a look. I'm going to, first of all, credit my, let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to credit my um, co-authors uh, in the paper that we put together. Okay. Um, uh, Tegan McGinnis and Octavio Rodriguez helped me put this, uh, 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 worked with me to put this together. Um, and basically, I mean, one of the things that jumped out at us when we looked at the data mm -hmm. is if you look at the next slide, um, femicides um, as a percentage or a proportion of all violence in Mexico have been fairly consistent. I'm sorry, female homicides. When you look at the number of female homicides in Mexico, the number hasn't changed over the last 30 years. Since 1990, the number of homicides that have targeted women, that have focused on women, has been about one in 10. And so part of the reason that we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of women being killed is that we have seen an enormous increase in the number of people being killed in Mexico. Um, and so as the number of homicides has gone up, the number of female homicides has gone up. And that might lead one to think that well, then femicide's not a problem. It's just a, a sign of rising violence in Mexico. But that is not the case. When you go to the next slide, you see that actually women are killed differently than men. Um, there is a different uh, set of motives in many cases when women are killed. And we see that most particularly when you look at, I mean, uh, women are much more likely to be killed by gun violence than um, men. And women are much more likely to be killed uh, in crimes where there's an otro elemento, another type of or mode of killing. And that's often um, a, a, an, an overarching category for things like strangulation, blunt force trauma, basically violence where you have to get close to the person or you're in intimate contact with the person. Um, and so it's a category of violence that is much more likely to be between people who know each other uh, and to be targeting a person because she is a woman. So in these different states, you have um, categorizations that list you know, whether there was sexual uh, violence, whether um, there were any um, antecedents of violence in, this, in the family of the victim of um, violence. Uh, um, domestic violence and so on. So when we talk about femicide, I'll, I'll stop uh, after the next two slides. So um, the, if you go to the next slide, um, when we talk about the concept of femicide and under Mexican law, specifically the concept of feminicide, because the, the two concepts are, are slightly different. Uh, femicide refers to killing a person because of their identity as a woman. And it's important to point out that that person may be a transgender person who identifies as woman, uh, as a woman. 
So there are different nuances in, say, state laws mm -hmm. as to whether you're actually considered a femicide if you're transgender. Um, but the concept of feminicide is the specific criminal offense that's listed in Mexican federal legislation and in, at the state level um, that has specific modalities um, in Mexico and Latin America. And, and, and it's here when we look at the next slide and we see how um, uh, the number of feminicides has increased. I, I lied. I totally lied because I got one more slide. Um, <laughs> when we see how the number of feminicides have increased in law, it's actually we've, we've seen authorities um, investigating more cases of femicide. The rate of increase in investigating cases of feminicide has been greater than the actual rate of increase in um, the number of um, female killings. So we have to ask ourselves, why are we seeing, um, we, we understand maybe why we're seeing more females being killed along with overall levels of violence, but what's going on when it comes to femicide investigations? Um, why have authorities really begun to zo uh, zo zone in on classifying these cases as feminicides, and they've been very aggressive about doing it in the last couple of years. The last slide I will show you for, at this point is this slide, which shows the makeup of the mode of killing in um, femicides, classi formally classified as feminicides under, um, Mex by Mexican authorities, and female homicides. That category that I mentioned earlier of uh, crimes committed by otro elemento, um, when we look at feminicides, these cases that are being brought forward by authorities and defined as feminicides tend to be those really tough cases, those cases that are extremely brutal forms of violence, um, such as the ones that we saw mm -hmm. in the documentary and such as the kinds of crimes that we see when it comes to uh, interpersonal violence between men and women. I'll stop there. No, and you're right, uh, Dr. Shark, because in, in the docuseries, what we saw, Javier, was that they were trying to classify or find an emotional, physical, trusting relationship, right, between Reina and um, the... Femicide. Exactly. And so I, I think that shows, right, that sometimes it's hard to classify um, a femicide as a femicide, and sometimes it's easier or more convenient to classify it as a homicide. Am I correct, Dr. Shirk? Exactly. Okay. So, um, Javier, for you, I would like to know what, what inspired you to do this series as a, as a producer, and also what comes next, right? I mean, you've raised awareness. You've showed that there's a lot of interest um, in Mexico and beyond, but I know that uh, Justice Alivar presented a, a, an initiative, right, to the, con to the Mexican Congress. Mm -hmm. Does that, do you think that's going to be sufficient? Do you think it's actually going to, um, you know, solve many of the issues that are still, um, you know, existent in Mexico? Well, uh, let me answer your, both of your questions. The first one, why did I get involved in this? Basically, when I found out there was a kind of Hannibal, kill, uh, Hannibal Electric killer in Mexico, I wrote a piece in, uh, in uh, Mexico's main newspaper, Tola Universal. And uh, this, this piece of article was read in 48 hours 700,000 times. Wow. Uh, 700,000 times. That, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. For any journalist in Mexico, that's a lot. Basically, so after seeing these numbers, I know there was a story to tell. And I started writing a book. Mm -hmm. But basically, when I entered the investigation and, and I saw that the, the serial killer had everything filmed, and also when I saw these very uh, potent um, uh, stories being told by the first responders and the victims, basically we changed from a book to, to an, uh, an audiovisual series. And uh, the main purpose of it, and that's why it went on, on public television, is basically we wanted to impact society. We wanted to, 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 to it was um, a call to change how things work in Mexico. So far, I think it's, it's working. I mean, these, these new laws that have been presented in Congress by both the legislative and, um, and the judicial branches, um, I think they are just a small step, but a step in the right direction. Uh, as Dr. Shirk was mentioning, m uh, practically all 
of women killing in Mexico, it's it's a local jurisdiction. So basically, it's the states that have to to, to solve things, mm -hmm. and this is not addressed at the federal level. Basically, it's addressed at the local level. So uh, the federal level will give them some tools, some general guidance, but still the work needs to be done at the at the state level, and the way basically uh, district attorneys work in Mexico is very faulty. So they have to work on that, and also uh, people are very um, untrusty of, of their authorities in Mexico. As you've mm -hmm. seen here, uh, Bruno, which was, or is actually, the commander of the SWAT force of Tlanepantla, which is a big city, you see how this main part of the state, a SWAT officer, is completely uh, uh, re-victimized, how, how, how he's very, very uh, hurt by, by, by what happened. Imagine if, if a SWAT commander ends after dealing with authorities 11 months in that way, mm -hmm. what do you expect of any regular citizen? So it's, it's very problematic. So you have to be very empathic and you have to kind of work all things together for people to, to trust in the authorities, but also to, to authorities to make uh, better of what they're supposed to do. In this case, after we talked basically with a number of, of families from the victims, the way they were mistreated by authorities, it was it was horrendous. And authorities are just uh, are very 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 um, they're not very sensible of what's going on. For instance, you would imagine that after the authorities seeing the local authorities that there was cannibalism being done in a huge way, hundreds, maybe thousands of people becoming cannibals, you would at least expect them to have like a hotline for some psychological help, you know? but that didn't happen. So basically they just turned a blind, a blind eye. Actually, the mayor of the town where this was happening, which is a major town called Atizapan, he tried to censor the, 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 the film, basically. Well, and they tampered with evidence, right? They tampered with evidence, and then they the didn't investigate and they, the and sister's they, uh, house, and they sold it, and they didn't investigate practically anything. Yeah. Basically, when, when the, the, another chapter will be going to Oaxaca to, to investigate mm -hmm. the origin of the of the femicide. No authorities wanted to go to well, well, mm -hmm. Oaxaca. No? So basically, we, they, they, we have to correct the whole system. Basically, it, it is all wrong, and also, uh, if you can understand, on chapter five, many of the um, of the neighbors or tenants of the femicide kind of knew what was going on many, many years ago. And no one pressed a, a former claim, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated thing, and it's been just getting worse over time, and impunity is now mm -hmm. a big factor, you know. People are killing women because they think they can get away with it, and that's what we're trying to change. And I think one of the, the issues that Irene Tello raised from Impunidad Cero was that a lot of women don't want to go to the authorities mm. because they think that it's, you know, a waste of time or they're not going to help them or they're going to ask them for money. And so a lot of these, you know, cases don't even get presented to authorities for, for these reasons. Dr. Shark, uh, you know, part of, part of the, the femicide initiative at the Mexico Institute is, is really directed towards producing sound public policies that can be adopted in Mexico. And you you presented three recommendations towards the end of your working paper that I think are very important. Can you walk us through them and explain them to us? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it, it, one of the things that the film underscores is the, or the, sorry, the film series underscores is that authorities um, are often slow and inept in their responses to criminal violence of all kinds, but especially um, the violence that, that targets women and uh, especially women from marginalized communities um, who are often uh, victims of, of this kind of, of violence. Uh, not necessarily serial killers, but uh, violence, uh, d domestic violence targeting them because of their gender. and. Um, the, what we found that was quite interesting is that in states where the, um, the community um, or uh, the authorities had come and, and the authorities had come together to form special uh, fiscalias, like mm -hmm. in the state of Mexico, uh, they feature uh, Dilcia Garcia, who is the, the uh, state's special prosecutor for gender crimes. 
in those states where there is a designated authority within the uh, public prosecutor's office, um, there is, as you mentioned earlier, a much higher probability uh, or much higher number of um, femicide cases that will be identified. There's a dedicated authority there looking for these kinds of crimes and trying to um, get prosecutors to classify them as femicides as they're doing their investigations. So one simple recommendation um, would be to create special prosecutors' offices in all Mexican states um, to dedicate those resources for um, uh, identifying and uh, investigating cases as femicides. Um, now, what our research is, is showing is that um, the number of femicide, femicide cases identified by state varies greatly, and a major determining factor is whether you have one of these special prosecutors. The problem is, um, not when, when you then follow those cases that have been identified by a special prosecutor and look at whether they are actually ultimately prosecuted as femicides, the numbers drop off very dramatically. And that's because proving the specific motive yeah. of um, uh, wanting to hurt someone because of their gender, as we saw in court, really requires a lot of very um, uh, material uh, evidence that shows that this was the objective. And uh, that's not always necessarily present in the kinds of cases that are being brought before um, the authorities as femicides. So in many cases, they have to make a choice. Do I prosecute this as a homicide or do I prosecute it as a femicide? If you lose your femicide case because you can't prove the elements of femicide, that person walks free and they cannot be prosecuted again because there's no double jeopardy, so they cannot be tried for homicide. So one of the, the, the second recommend, in addition to having special prosecutors, the second recommendation that we think is important is um, creating classification systems in Mexican criminal codes that would allow for aggravating circumstances for homicide. In other words, you should be able to prosecute someone for homicide and also seek an aggravated, a sentence for the aggravated um, uh, condition or um, circumstances that you targeted them because they were a woman. You could arguably have those aggravating circumstances for other things like crimes against LGBT persons, et cetera. But you'd still get the homicide even if the court would not allow you to get those additional charges that would come with um, essentially those aggravating circumstances. They do exist for other kinds of crimes in Mexico, just not for homicide and just not for specifically gender-related crimes. The third thing that's important to do, regardless of whether we're going to um, develop special prosecutor's offices, um, regardless of whether we're going to um, provide the um, aggravated sentence option for prosecutors, we definitely need to uh, direct more resources and training to prosecutors' offices because one of the other big determining factors as to whether or not these cases are getting identified and getting uh, properly investigated and prosecuted is whether the prosecutor's office has the, the, the forensic personnel, uh, has uh, the, the trained personnel to identify and, and look for these kinds of cases. Right. I, I was going to ask you about the budget because I think setting up a special prosecutor, you can just kind of check that box, right? But I think actually... You got to give them some money. Exactly. Resources and training, yeah. right? Yeah. In fact, so when you, if you just look at states, if you control for state budget and whether there's a prosecutor, um, it doesn't really matter if you have a public, pro a special prosecutor for gender crimes if they're in a state that has the same level of budget because effectively you're spreading those resources more thinly mm -hmm. across um, many different categories of special prosecutors perhaps in that state. So what we found is that having a special prosecutor tends to happen in states where you're directing more resources anyway to prosecuting those crimes. So part of this really does boil down to whether you're investing in um, proper criminal investigations in your state or not. Um, it makes a big difference whether the state uh, attorney general's office or fiscalia is actually um, receiving adequate resources to do its job. Very interesting. Again, you can find Dr. Shirk's publication on the Mexico Institute website. So be before we begin our Q&A session, uh, we would like to share uh, Alejandra Moras Moras, uh, the uh, 
Recorded remarks. She, again, is the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission for Women. Soy Alejandra Mora Mora, Secretaria Ejecutiva de la Comisión Interamericana de Mujeres. Quiero agradecer este espacio particularmente al Wilson Center y también un reconocimiento a la Poder Judicial de México por eh, colocar esta reflexión a través de este drama eh, humano. Eh, es una historia de terror, pero es una historia real, donde hay una serie de personas implicadas y de eh, sentimientos y de todo lo que está alrededor de la violencia contra las mujeres. Quiero hacer tres consideraciones de punto de partida. La primera es que existe una estratificación de personas y es lo que hemos venido señalando desde una perspectiva de género y feminista. Eh, algo pasa en el sistema, en el patriarcado con las mujeres. Desaparecen las mujeres y, y no existe una reacción colectiva frente a esta desaparición. Hay una subvaloración de lo femenino y me parece que este es un elemento sustancial que hemos venido colocando para la reflexión de la violencia contra las mujeres. Eh, hay otro elemento importante y es que el, la, el video y, y la serie da cuenta de una forma de violencia extrema y a lo mejor quienes lo ven van a decir que eso pasa muy, con muy poca frecuencia. Y lo que tenemos que entender es que estamos hablando de un continuum de violencia, que las distintas, hay distintas manifestaciones de violencia que tienen la misma forma de actuar en relaciones de poder, de abuso, de control, eh, de manera que estamos hablando de una misma forma de violencia pero con distintos ropajes. Así que, así como nos duele lo que pasa en, este, en esta serie, que nos duela cualquier otra forma de violencia que viven las mujeres, eh, porque es el mismo drama eh, en escala y porque estamos hablando, insisto, de un continuum de violencia. Y eh, el otro tema que me parece muy importante eh, es eh, poner en dimensión cuando las mujeres desaparecen, porque muchas mujeres desaparecen y, y este, este elemento tiene que ser reconsiderado por parte de la justicia y de los operadores de todo lo que es la seguridad de los estados. No puede ser que desaparezca alguien y solo reaccionemos eh, no sé cuántas horas después. Desaparecer significa que puede estar muerta o desaparecer puede significar también que es una víctima de trata y que también es otra forma de morir eh, en, en, una, en una esclavitud sexual. De manera que las dimensiones de la desaparición para todo el mundo, y particularmente para México, debe ser resignificada y hay una serie de recomendaciones de la CIM, del MESECVI, para este, para este tema. Y termino señalando en estos puntos de partida el tema de la impunidad. La impunidad ha sido consustancial a lo que sucede con la violencia hacia las mujeres. Eh, la mayor parte de los casos de violencia sexual y de feminicidios, o por lo menos hay una alta tasa que es diferenciada de otros casos de, digamos, de desestimiento y de impunidad. Y esto tiene un efecto sobre la credibilidad del sistema y también tiene un efecto sobre la capacidad de las mujeres de acudir a poner una denuncia de los familiares en su defecto para poner las denuncias. Y esto, eh, que es consustancial al sistema, tenemos que mejorarlo. Quiero plantear en México, eh, porque estamos hablando de, de lo que está sucediendo en la región, pero también particularmente en este país, que ha sido alarmante el aumento que se ha venido dando en las formas de violencia contra las mujeres y que desafortunadamente, a pesar de los esfuerzos que se han venido haciendo, continúa aumentando. Eh, desde la CIM eh, hemos venido eh, hablando de la complejidad 
de eh, este tema y de la necesidad de la articulación de las políticas públicas de lo nacional y de lo local. No puede ser que haya personas de primera, segunda categoría y también que la ruralidad y, y de y determine también otra condición de acceso a servicios y a sistemas de seguridad y, y esto debe ser considerado por parte de las autoridades. Eh, otro tema que eh, es fundamental es humanizar a las víctimas. Cuando nosotros hablamos de las víctimas como un número más, como, como, como un número y no eh, como lo que son personas, sueños, proyectos eh, que están ahí y que se rompieron y que se truncaron y que además afecta a las personas asociadas a su familia, a quienes le conocían, a, a los hijos, a los padres, a las madres. Eh, cuando uno empieza a humanizarlas, empieza a mirar distinto lo que sucede con la violencia. No se trata de un número, sino se trata de personas. Y, eh, y por eso cuando trabajamos en derechos humanos tenemos que trabajar no solo con la razón, sino desde una perspectiva del corazón, de de los sentimientos, porque por ahí pasa trabajar en derechos humanos. Eh, quiero um, señalar que para nosotras el tema de la prevención es un eje absolutamente fundamental y que utilizar esta serie para prevenir, para reflexionar, para decir lo que está sucediendo y para eh, cumplir con los mandatos que tiene Belén do Pará, que no solamente investigar y sancionar, sino que también es prevenir y para hacer cambios profundos en nuestra cultura. Muchos de los elementos estereotipados y todo lo que está alrededor de los entornos del que perpetra el hecho son importantes y pueden ser trabajados desde una perspectiva de prevención. Y también el rol de las comunidades es fundamental, las comunidades organizadas eh, donde cada mujer cuenta son fundamentales en el tema de la prevención. También es muy importante eh, hablar de las políticas nacionales. Eh, los femicidios suelen depender de dinámicas sociales y familiares y en ese sentido deben de generarse diagnósticos focalizados que permitan contrastar eh, los contextos específicos donde estos, estos femicidios se dan. Es decir, estoy hablando de la necesidad de diagnósticos en tiempo real localizados para cada comunidad. No es lo mismo la ruralidad que el urbano, no es lo mismo la pobreza que barrios donde no existe pobreza. Eh, y esto da entonces el pleno contexto de lo que eh, sucede y permite entonces que las políticas sean focalizadas y esta es una recomendación que venimos haciendo sistemáticamente, así como el MESECPI. Termino señalando eh, el, un mensaje claro sobre el tema de la violencia contra las mujeres, de la necesidad de la transformación cultural, política, social, económica y de justicia, necesita de profundas voluntades. Eh, empezar ahora, eh, tener el liderazgo de instituciones estratégicas, es parte de eso, pero tenemos que sumar muchas más y espero que podamos movilizarnos a través de esto, de humanizar lo que le sucede a las víctimas. Muchas gracias. Again, thank you to Secretary Mora for her remarks. We are going to open up the floor to some questions. Um, we, we do have a couple of minutes to take some questions from our in-person audience, but we've also received some questions from our virtual audience. So is there anybody that has a question here for our panelists? I have two short questions. One is, did it happen in the northern suburbs, Mexico City? Is that where? That's yes. Yeah. And uh, do I have it correct that it was about two per week for 30 years? That's what he told police when he was captured. Hi, thank you. And well, I mean, 
I would like to first congratulate. I think this is a fantastic job. And obviously, being a Mexican woman is a horrible thing to see, right? Especially when you're outside of your country. Um, however, I wanted to know the your thoughts, um, ideas. Sometimes, and there are some studies that mention obvious, uh, also that sometimes when we pay attention to all these uh, gender violence, then gender violence become much more aggressive. So I would like to know what are your thoughts? What, what's, a, what's the media supposed to do with this, for example? Thank you. What is your name? Mariana. Mariana, thank you for your question. It's a very important question. Um, that, that was part of, uh, of the outlines we set up when we decided to, to do the film, basically. Uh, we spoke to a number of specialists, basically. First of all, our, our team basically came mainly done by Mexican women that were investigating this particular case. And uh, we set a number of outlines, basically, not to do what we call apologia delito. So basically, we were very focused on that part. And uh, however, we decided two things. We decided to go public because we wanted uh, authorities to, to take notice that we were working on these issues and that we couldn't be just, just bystanders of what was going on when basically you saw that there were uh, 20 Mexican women a day disappearing and 11 of them being killed. I, for me, that's just uh, an impressive number. It was, that was something I could not, uh, no, not tolerate anymore. Um, personally, I was very careful with it. Uh, Camilla Productions, which is uh, the, 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 the co-producing company, basically, it's named after my daughter. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, the first production of Camilla Productions, and basically, I just put it there to remind me how careful I had to be with, with, with this type of information that, that we have, no? And of course, we had all sort of videos. We, we could have done something very, very gore, but we actually, we only did it, what we did basically was something that people would look at it and would try to change their perspective of things. And I think we, it was, it was risky. We, we got a lot of advice from a lot of specialists in the issue, including Alejandra Mora. She, she, she saw this seriously in a, on, a, on a private screening, basically, and we took the advice of many specialists, how to address the issue, how not to re-victimize women, uh, how to give voice to the killer without uh, making people show pity for him. And basically, particularly, we were very, very respectful of the victims. I personally um, spoke with a number of them, and I was myself at, uh, at a number of days where, the, where this uh, uh, the judgment of, 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 of uh, Andres. No? And uh, so we were very careful. But basically, those are uh, horrendous numbers that we're seeing in Mexico, and we just couldn't keep uh, silent. No? The, the, the Mexican Supreme Court, it's giving a lot of rights to women uh, lately, basically. I know there's a huge debate, and I won't go into it, about the you know, Roe versus Wade being changed here in the United States. But Mexico, uh, just a couple of, of years ago, actually a couple of, mo of months ago, um, Mexico uh, enhanced uh, w women's uh, rights on the side what to do with their bodies. On a number of states, if your husband uh, uh, raped women, he, he, he would, it would be not even a crime because it was your husband. The court got away with that. There was also some gender-based uh, uh, hirings for, for, for women becoming judges. A, a whole lot of sets were, uh, have been given lately by the Mexican court for women in Mexico. I think it's a very, a very important moment for women in Mexico. But I told them, the court, basically, what's the purpose of giving so many rights to the women if they're being killed and then they're not being able to use any of it? So, so let's, let's, let's do something that's very uncomfortable for authorities and let's do something that really works out. Uh, so far, as I was telling you, the way the Mexican audience has reacted has, been, has impressed everybody in Mexico. Nielsen and Televisa, the public channels, the media, the, 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 it, it was a, a huge blockbuster in Mexico. And just within five days, in such a polar society as Mexico, we were able to, to, to sit at the same table, uh, Morena and the uh, PRI and the PAN. It was just, it was just uh, really a dream come true. And I hope uh, these things keep evolving and uh, DAs start doing better the job. 
and people start trusting authorities, and people start denouncing what they know is happening because pe people know. It's just that they keep quiet. So basically, I hope um, uh, the documentary is just a, a, a first step towards many that some other people will have to take. But uh, in, in my time as executive producer, I think we have done so far what uh, what we set that set out to do, and uh, things are starting to to move. Dr. Shirk, do you have a comment for that, or should we? Not, not for that specific question. Okay. Well, we have a, a question from our virtual audience. We have two that I'm going to try and cover really quickly because we're running out of time. Um, they asked, what specific laws would you recommend that Mexico reforms to help investigate femicides? So I, I think, um, first of all, the as I mentioned, it would be really helpful mm -hmm. if the um, federal um, criminal code and state criminal codes could be adapted so that uh, homicide as a category of crime were um, eligible to have uh, aggravating circumstances. Delitos, que, si fuera uh, homicidio un delito calificado, mm -hmm. uh, if there were circumstances involving gender motivated um, uh, activities. Um, I, I think it's also, um, it, it's not just a question of modifying laws. Uh, it's about building prosecutorial capacity. Mm -hmm. And that is not, that is a policy decision, not a legislative um, act. And so um, in, in most states, prosecutors do not have adequate resources um, and adequate professional uh, development and training and professional protections to be able to develop uh, effective investigations. So for me, that's a uh, particularly important issue. Okay. And Javier, in a minute, because <laughs> we have so many questions. I know that um, we unfortunately can't get to all of them, but um, one person asked, we know investigative journalists have been killed for investigating femicide. Could you please comment on that? I know that you probably can't answer that in a minute, but. Well, I, I hope I don't get killed. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I think you know, being a journalist in many countries, it's complicated. Being a journalist in Mexico, it's complicated nowadays. Um, and uh, and uh, basically, we but we have to do what we have to do. No? So, so let's on keep on working and doing uh, journalism. Well, um, unfortunately, again, we are out of time, but. I want to thank everybody who joined us this afternoon, both in person as well as um, virtually. This is the official launch of the Femicide Initiative of the Mexico Institute. And I want to thank Javier Tejado, Dr. David Shirk, for being here with us today. And again, thank you to our sponsor, Constellation Brands. I would, I, I would also like to share with everybody that our blog on femicide is now live. Um, if any of you would like to contribute to the blog, we would be delighted to receive and read your opinions. Um, if you would like to submit an entry, please visit the Mexico Institute's website, or you can send an email to samantha.kane at wilsoncenter.com. And we now invite everyone who is here in person to a reception right here on the sixth floor. And to our virtual audience, thank you for your interest. And we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you, everybody, for being here.